stories you might like to share. And there we go. We just ticked over at the appointed time. So welcome to In Search of Dark Skies. Uh, it's part of the, uh, it's my presentation is part of the International Dark Sky Week, IDSW, hashtag IDSW 2021. My name is Mike Shaw, and um, I'll be presenting this evening. And the International Dark Sky Week is hosted by the uh, International Dark Sky Association. And there's so many, I'm, I'm proudly displaying my Discover the Night uh, uh, Dark Sky Week t-shirt. You can pick up your own version of this uh, following the links at the darksky.org site. But there's so many different quests for, or, or stories that go behind each of our shared experiences with the night sky, uh, especially dark night skies. And, you know, it's just one of these things that, um, I'd love to hear each of your stories if we had the time. Hello, Kia Ora, Cameron from New Zealand. There you are. It's, I think, tomorrow, today, yesterday, a different time zone. Good to see you, Cameron. Thanks for joining in. And, um, you know, it's uh, just there's a, a bazillion different stories from Min Milton, has it old Milton, uh, about, you know, ways to ex experience the night sky and to enjoy it ourselves. You know, uh, during this International Dark Sky Week, it's, I've heard so many stories from so many different people about their immersive experience with with uh, the Milky Way, with you know experiencing, you know the, uh, the the mystic connections to history through Bronze Age stone circles in England. I mean, there's just so many different aspects of this. But what I'm going to do is uh, welcome you again. The format is I'm going to present some material. There's really three parts to the presentation this evening, as I'll describe in a moment. And all throughout, if you have a question, please type it into the uh, box. The, the, there's a chat feature that a couple of you have already introduced yourselves, and I appreciate that. Um, so you can type in the question there, or there is a feature at the bottom. You can raise your, you can, uh, there's a, it says speak, you can tap it. Um, I, I'll get notified, and I think I can then open up a, an audio channel. But there's no video in this uh, this evening, for better or for worse. So uh, make yourself comfortable, relax, kick back. No one's going to see anything. and We'll just dive into it. So with that, I am going to uh, take a moment and work my magic with the various um, screens here. And I hope that this is going to, this is this should work out just fine. So there we go. All right. So I um, don't need the finder up there, do we? There we go. Okay. In search of dark night skies. Let's get into it. So here's a, here's a video, a time lapse of the Aurora Borealis. This is a beautiful phenomenon. I hope each of you get a chance to see this in your lifetime. Uh, this is in uh, within the state of Minnesota. You can see the shimmering curtains, the dancing pillars, the different colors from the nitrogen and oxygen uh, atoms and molecules in the Earth's atmosphere. Uh, this was from just about a year or so ago. And one of the interesting things about the aurora is that the light in the sky comes from behind the clouds. And the reason I want to point this out is going to be germane to the, what you'll see on the next slide. Hey, Kurt in Bloomington, Indiana. So on the next slide, you're about to see a different version of illuminated clouds. But what was interesting in this experience is that um, you could see the clouds, you know, uh, backlit, if you, if, you, if, if, if you were. So the light is coming from behind the clouds. And I'll never forget, um, several years ago, there was a, a mutual friend to, I think, a couple of the folks here, Roger, who commented that they had never seen clouds in a dark sky location. And the reason for saying that is clouds in a dark sky location are just invisible. I mean, they're black. There's no light reflecting off them. There's no light coming from behind them except starlight. And they just appear like holes in the sky. And you know, most of the people, most, most of us live in you know, cities, urban areas, where when you see the lights, there's a cloud, the light is coming, it's reflecting off the clouds, as you can see in this um, uh, slide of the of the summer Milky Way. This was shot about 100 miles north of Minneapolis in the state of Minnesota. And what you can see here is, of course, the Milky Way. You can see Saturn and Jupiter before they went through the great conjunction of this last year. But if you look close to the, uh, near the horizon, at the, at the bottom part of the image here, you can actually see, right where I've got my little cursor, I think you can see my mouse, you can see the Milky Way disappearing behind some low clouds. And these low clouds are reflecting the yellow lights of the cities, and that's why we can see the clouds. And if you contrast this image with um, an image that is uh, 
Uh, let's see how I can do it. <laughs> I'm trying to be really clever and that's always a mistake. If you contrast that with this image, which shows the uh, the same view just a couple of nights um, uh, later, if I remember correctly, this is only, this is much closer to the, it's about 25 miles north of Minneapolis. And what a difference it makes to the night sky. You can still see, uh, you know, Jupiter and Saturn. You can still see much of the structure of the Milky Way, but you see this enormous dome of sky glow. And we're going to talk about what that is and what causes it and how you can affect it. And it, it's just a remarkable thing because just within a few days of each other, I think it might have been, even been within a 24 hour period, come to think of it, there was this enormous um, change in the uh, in the appearance of the of the night sky because of this sky glow effect, and that's what we're going to be talking about. So, just a dif difference of 75 miles can have this effect. So, this talk has three parts, as I mentioned. The first part, we're going to talk about just what is there to see in the night sky. Just give a kind of a brief overview of some some cool things and some interesting um, observations, and then we're going to talk about this issue of sky glow and uh, you know what it is and, and how, it, um, uh, how it affects our view of the night sky. And then we're gonna talk a little bit about you know, how we can measure it, how we can characterize it, and what we can all do collectively to mitigate our uh, impact on the visibility of the dark sky. So we're gonna start with what's, what are some cool things to see in the night sky, and of course, we're gonna start with constellations. See, these are so much fun to, to pick out and to begin a journey of exploration. You can see here at the bottom, this is, this is an, uh, almost a complete sky view um, looking, uh, looking north. You can see uh, Polaris just here at the tail of the Little Dipper. You can see the big Ursa Major, the Big Dipper of the Plow. Uh, you can see Arcturus over here. You can see um, uh, Cygnus and Ve uh, Cassiopeia. Just a few of the key, Draco the Dragon here. Um, and, and finding, picking out these brighter star constellations is such a treat with your by yourself with your friends and your family and spoiler alert i'm going to tell you that surprisingly one of the outcomes of this um of this project that i'm going to be telling you about sponsored by the bell museum it's a resident artist project is that anywhere in the state you can pick out the brightest stars and this is actually a remark a surprisingly good thing because that those are the ones that you can use to identify the constellations so you might think oh man the skies are too bright i can't really see anything i say quite au contraire, you know, um, because the skies are so bright, you're only able to see the bright stars, and those are the ones that make up the constellations, so it's even easier to pick out the constellations, so there really is an enormous silver lining um, in the fact that, uh, of this uh, scope of light pollution. Here's the great treat of, a little bit jerky, but nonetheless, there it is. Oh, there's a little burst of an aurora and a plane going by, but this was certainly the great treat of 2020, even though we have this um, awful pandemic um, that still is uh, you know, raging onwards. And just having this ability to see this comet, which was kind of came out of the blue, and the different spectacles associated with really, really something interesting. This was an all night time lapse. You can see some mists coming in there in the early morning. And then this next little time lapse, I zoomed into the head of the comet. And if you look very carefully, you can actually see the comet moving against the background of stars. So as you know, the, what, and what's interesting is the direction of the comet's motion is vertical in this particular time lapse. Let's see if we can play that one again. There we go. And as you see the comet moving upwards, you see the, the sunlight, which is to the left, is actually forcing the, the, the light from the sun, the radiation from the sun is actually forcing the dust particles and the ions emitted by the comet off to the right hand side. You can actually see there's an ion trail, which is straight, and then this dust trail right here. And this dust trail, of course, is what leads to comets when the Earth goes through uh, these things. And this motion become, became very apparent um, over the course of just a few nights. You can see here, I think you can make it out. It might be a little bit tricky with the um, internet connection to see the outline of the, the, the Ursa Major, again, the Big Dipper. And you can see the comet near the horizon. And right on the next slide, is I've highlighted the little feet of the Great Bear, Ursa Major, and you can see how the comet has moved across the sky pretty noticeably just in three days between the 17th of July and the 20th of July. That was three days of last summer. And the, uh, the comet has moved from, as you can see over here, all the way over here. So it's, it's really it was moving in a pretty good clip. So anyway, it's one of the cool things you can keep an eye out for. But here's another thing I want to illustrate is this is another image of the comet on the left. Early in the dawn morning, you can see here um, the Hyades, you can see uh, the planet Mars, 
Uh, you can see the Pleiades up here, and you can see the foot of, uh, of Perseus. And guess what? It turns out that the astronauts on board the space station had about the same view uh, just a few days later. It was quite of a remarkable thing. And the reason I want to share this with you is that in some way, I hope this um, convinces you that in we are really all astronauts ourselves, whether we're on the space station, whether we're on Earth, we're seeing the same thing. It's There's no difference. I mean, the space, the astronauts are, you know, a couple hundred miles closer to the stars than we are, but that's really negligible in the grand picture of the distances of the stars. And in fact, I'm going to play a little short time lapse that may or may not start. Okay, I'm going to, I'm going to start this one, but here's a, a classic view. And if you're from Minnesota, you immediately recognize Split Rock Lighthouse. This is this beautiful starry sky. And as I put this time lapse into motion, this is viewed from the perspective of the stars, as if we were on a spaceship. So let's 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 play the let's play the the clip and see what it looks like. And what I want you to uh, not not to pretend, but to envision, as if in fact, yes, you are an astronaut. Oh, where do we go? Here it goes. Okay, three, two, one, go. <sighs> Look at that. The sky is remaining stationary, and the Earth is rotating. Of course, it is. All these stars are coming into view because the Earth is rotating out of the way. That's what you would see on board the International Space Station. We just happen to be shooting this from a little bit closer to Earth um, until it's all the way gone and all we are left with this view of the stars. So anyway, that was a little thought experiment. It's kind of fun to think about as a little side project of mine. I thought I'd take this opportunity to share this. But there's so many things to enjoy. Here's the classic view of the full moon setting behind the state capitol building in, in Minnesota. This was a gorgeous scene. This was about a, 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 a full year ago, a little over a year ago now, in March of 2020. This was the supermoon right before the pandemic locked, locked us all down. You can see the flags flying behind the Capitol building and, and the moon coming into position. It was just a glorious, beautifully clear morning, as you can probably tell. I was set up, I think, about seven miles away with a super long telephoto lens. You can see the sky brightening as the as daylight begins to occur. You know, when it comes to the full moon, that's, that's not the only uh, thing to enjoy. Here's the, a time lapse of the lunar eclipse of, um, I think it was 2019. Now, you know, January of 2019, this was at the Bell Museum. You can see how the foreground stays the same as the Earth passes into the, as the, as the moon passes into the Earth's shadow and becomes darker. And here it comes out the other side before they kicked us off the deck. You know, so, the, you know, there's a lot of things to see with the skies, the moons. Here's a time, short time lapse of an all sky view of uh, stars rotating around the um, North Celestial Pole with Polaris right there at the center. This is, of course, in the Northern Hemisphere looking over a, a river in Minnesota. And of course, a static view of North facing star trails looks something like this with a moonlit sky. Look at the beautifully lit foreground. You know, we'll be talking about why the sky is blue in just a minute. And on a dark moonless night, you can get in the opposite direction. This is facing south in the Northern Hemisphere. You can really see the rotation of the of the stars in the opposite direction, um, in a clockwise direction in this case. Um, uh, but the south celestial polar course is below the horizon. And then what about the International Space Station? Here's a shot of that as it emerges over the horizon and flies overhead. And just think about the people that are living inside this little speck of light that's reflecting sunlight uh, towards us in Earth. So it's you know, the International Space Station is always a perennial favorite to uh, to capture. Now, when we get into uh, things a little bit further out, we have, um, of course, the Milky Way. We have the planet Jupiter here rising over these trees, these pine trees. You have a meteor flashing through the uh, Earth's atmosphere. Of course, the meteor is a little bit closer than the space station. But nonetheless, there's always things to see. Here's a bright pink nebula. What's that? Here are a couple more pink nebula. What are these? Here's a little star cluster and some other things. What are those? There's so many things to see. What are these dark patches? Why are these yellow? Why are these green over here? It's an incredible thing. Um, answers forthcoming. Here is a Mercury-Venus conjunction of, uh, I think it was a, a spring of last year. This is, you can just barely make out. It's not this one. This is Venus. And right down here is the planet Mercury. It's only visible just right after sunset or before sunrise, just close to the horizon as it uh, as we can see it reflecting the sunlight off the uh, off the planet surface. Another part of the project was to create these uh, virtual reality images. These are complete 360 degrees, uh, you know, 180 degrees top to bottom. You put this image into your VR goggles and it's if you're standing with me 
on the shore of Split Rock Lighthouse in Split Rock Lighthouse State Park. There's that lighthouse again. And you can see the Milky Way just arching overhead um, in this uh, beautifully dark location up in northern Minnesota. And so uh, those are just a few of the things that I thought I would um, illustrate. This is a, another of uh, a time lapse showing that we're rotating the camera to follow the night sky. But look what happens to the, in contrast to the Split Rock Lighthouse case, if you look close to the horizon, you can see that dome of sky glow that really impedes our view of the Milky Way. And the Milky Way doesn't have that same uh, structure and brightness because the sky itself is so bright. So what I want to do right now is to, you can see a spotlight here that's for some reason just literally shining up into the sky. And, uh, you know, here comes the morning sunlight. So the next thing I want to do right now is to talk about um, sky glow. What exactly is sky glow so we can understand what's going on with this? So let me start by giving you these two comparison images that are taken at precisely the same location two weeks apart. On the right, you can see the view with no moonlight. You can see the silhouettes of all the trees. You can see some snow on the ground. You can see the beautiful uh, winter Milky Way. You can see the Andromeda galaxy over here, all these dark lanes and structure. Uh, and then on the left, of course, you have exactly the same scene. These are literally taken at the same tripod location. I've highlighted the stick on the ground with this blue circle. This dead, well, I guess they're both, they're not dead, they're just frozen. I think it was about 10 below Fahrenheit. These different three trees, I've highlighted those, so you can see them for comparison. I took great pains to stand at the same location, even though it was a couple weeks apart. And look at the difference in the night sky. Um, if you, you know, because there's a slight difference in time, these, these three celestial objects, uh, the Andromeda galaxy, and then these two little stars, you can barely make them out here. That's a little bit of the Andromeda galaxy. They're still there, but on the left, you have this, um, this blue glow of the night sky. And what that is, is called sky glow. And sky glow is literally what that sounds like. It's glow, it's light that's glowing from the sky. On the right-hand side, there is no sky glow. On the left-hand side, there is sky glow. Sky glow. So what's the difference? Well, the difference is on the left, we have the, full, the nearly full moon illuminating the this, this scene. And when that moonlight hits the atmosphere, light plus atmosphere equals sky glow. That's the, that's the issue, that's the problem. On the left, this is a natural sky glow. It, it happens at night um, when the moon is up. That's the same exact reason that um, <laughs> the sky is blue during the day. Uh, a blue sky is natural sky glow from the sun. At night, when we have the moon, we have natural sky glow from the moon. And when there's no moon, there's no sky glow, and we have the best viewing of the stars because there isn't the stars aren't competing with the light that's emitted from the atmosphere. So uh, you can see a your view of this. Um, this is a NASA. <laughs> I always feel obliged to say this. This is a NASA shot. I did not take this image, um, but you can really see the, the the sky glow emitted from the. the it's it's a beautiful phenomenon. You know, Carl Sagan's blue marble and all that. But this is the uh, the Earth's atmosphere emitting. It's blue light as it's excited by the energy from the sun. Now, let's turn our attention to how light from that's human caused, caused by people, affects our view of the night sky. And that's really what this talk is about as part of International Dark Sky Week. So if you were late joining us, just welcome once again to our presentation on In Search of Dark Skies. And what you see here is a composite satellite image, again, from NASA. And this shows um, in North America, Central America, South America, uh, a little bit of Antarctica over here. And you can see these city lights. And the city lights are, uh, so I won't say the, the problem, but they're the, the source of a, of, an, of a phenomenon that affects all of us. And that's this issue of sky glow that I just described, because as you can now well imagine, the light emitted from cities and other large dense areas is bright enough to interact with the sky and cause artificial sky glow. So we have the natural sky glow from the sun during the day, natural sky glow from the moon during the moonlit nights. And now we have, you know, human caused uh, artificial sky glow from people from urban areas. And this is a, a light pollution map. It's a, it's, a, it's a map showing the degree of sky glow. Red is bad, black is good. Uh, Lightpollutionmap.info, it's a great resource. And what's interesting about this is that um, if you go to uh, various different, this is, this is a fairly uh, now famous or infamous region showing this, um, you know, this island of, of light over here and this other island of light and over here. This dark region is North Korea. 
and um, there, there's just not a lot of electricity there at night. And in fact, this shows up in the light pollution map, as you can see at this, uh, I mean, it's a, as a friend of mine likes to say, it's a night photographer's paradise, but it's kind of a one-way ticket. So um, I'm not planning to exercise that opportunity. Here's an interesting phenomenon. Here's, I don't know if you recognize, this is the United Kingdom here and uh, Ireland and, you know, Norway, Scandinavia and, uh, you know, France and Germany and Spain. This is the uh, English Channel. And there's what, th these are basically gas, you know, oil drilling rigs that are emitting light that is so intense that they actually look like little cities uh, from the sky. We have a similar thing here in North America. Here is, I'm right here in Minneapolis, St. Paul. This is uh, Los Angeles. You know, you got um, Cleveland, New York City, and Washington, D.C. What's this right here? What is that little area? That shows up in this light pollution map of the United States. That's up in North Dakota. That's a, that looks like a city that's even larger than Minneapolis, St. Paul, and it's uh, oil fracking. You know, it's a, it's a natural gas flares that the people are just burning off um, the extra gas uh, and it's causing these, this light that's lighting up the night sky and causing a lot of uh, sky glow, which is um, not so great. So I, I want to just raise your awareness about this. If this is the first time, I doubt it's the first time you've heard about this, but just in case it is, I just wanted to, to bring that up at the moment, at, the, um, at this time. And I want to now turn our attention. So this was, as I say, the, the work I'm about to present right now particularly relates to the work I did as part of a, a resident artist research project with the Bell Museum. I'm very grateful for the support from the Bell and the McKnight Foundation for this, for this opportunity. And it really focuses on, you know, the state where I live, which is in many, many, uh, <laughs> Minnesota. And I live in St. Paul, Minneapolis, which is down here, right on the border with Wisconsin. Um, it borders, uh, Minnesota borders Canada. Um, it's got some very dark skies. This is Boundary Waters Canoe Area Wilderness up here. And this is the state map. So if you haven't, if you're not familiar with this, this is what it looks like. This is what the, um, uh, the aerial view of Minnesota looks like. And so again, let me, let me go back to that. Here is the big cities in, in Minnesota, in case you're not familiar, is Minneapolis, St. Paul, Rochester down here, St. Cloud over here, and Duluth. So, so key in on Duluth, and Minneapolis, St. Paul, and you can see them here. This is Duluth. This is Minneapolis, St. Paul. And this line right here is the interstate that connects these two areas. Each one of these lines that radiates outward from the Twin Cities is a, a freeway or a highway. And you can see these little dots of light are little towns along that, uh, that, that road. Now, when you look at this, this doesn't look so bad. I mean, okay, these are little points of light. But the problem is this that when the light goes up into the atmosphere, it spreads outward, just like if you're driving in fog with the high beams on. And um, that light scatters and it spreads out and it affects a much bigger area than just what you might think by looking at these, um, these lights. Because keep in mind, again, this is an interstate. Each one of these little dots of light is a, is a little city along this interstate. Uh, so this is, this is about a two hour drive. Uh, it's about 120 miles between Duluth and, and um, St. Paul. So this distance is about 120 miles. Each one of these is a little, you know, not a little town, but a, a relatively small, smaller town. But look at the effect of the lights that stretch this outwards all through the countryside. And it's not until you get all the way up here that you really start to see an attenuation of that light. So what do these colors really mean? And I want to explain, I mean, you, you'll see these a lot. And I'm sort of a, a numbers person. I like, uh, you know, solving problems. That's sort of the way my brain is, is configured. And what these numbers represent are different levels of what's called the Bortle class scale, or simply the Bortle scale. And this was developed by someone whose name was John Bortle, and it was uh, published in 2001, 20 years ago, a little over 20 years ago now. And each of these numbers means it's, it's a representation of something, and it's that something I now want to explain uh, what those mean. And then I want to explain some measurements that I did and some visualizations, some photography I did to understand what these numbers different mean. So the numbers by themselves represent um, a factor of the natural sky brightness. So if you think back to, um, where was it? Let me see if I can find it quickly. If you think back to this image, where let's suppose that there's zero impact of human light, that would have a natural sky brightness of one on the Bortle scale. I mean, look here, you can actually see, you can make out the foreground. You can, you can, I was able to walk around very comfortably in this scene with no sky glow with no headlights. And when I do my photography workshops out in the field, 
we often do most of the you know, 99 percent of the time we don't have lights on we don't need them because you can your eyes are quite capable of seeing enough detail to walk uh, safely around so a natural sky brightness is one and then is used it's sort of a logarithmic scale as you can see so two five ten twenty fifty a hundred two hundred all the way up to a thousand so up here in the eight to nine Bordel classes, as you can see over here on the left on this map, which is like most of the Twin Cities, these have a natural sky brightness that's somewhere between you know 100 to a thousand times the brightness of a natural sky. So that's where that's the nature of the problem. And what does that mean? Is that we can't see the Milky Way. When the um, this is from a, uh, a nomogram by uh, H. Spellstra, and it's called the Night Sky Brightness Comparison Nomogram. It's super helpful. And I kind of redrew this here, but this was the original reference down here. I didn't come up with this. And what this conveys is how the visibility of the Milky Way, for example, um, is really gone after a, a border class of around six and higher. You know, if you're a border class five, you can maybe see it right overhead. Um, and things start to get better pretty quickly when you get down to the border class, you know, four and three and two. So this is... Um, one way the Bordel scale is uh, useful. Another way is how many stars can you see? And as I said, when I was, you know, thinking that, well, anyway, so how many stars can you see? And off, off to the right, you can see a representation of that, you know, five stars for the absolute brightest skies all the way down to several thousand stars when the sky is really dark. Think about that. When the sky is really dark, you can see that literally in, this, in a single sky, you can see thousands of stars all at one view. Um, you know, there's just some numbers here. I'm going to maybe skip over this part, but in case you're interested, uh, <laughs> there's a sky brightness, which is ab actually measured in the, uh, it's a quantitative unit of the, the magnitude of the bright sky in square arc seconds. And um, you can see that the uh, uh, brightness increases as you, uh, it's, again, this is a weird logarithmic scale. And this is the thing that's measured by a sky quality meter. So if you have one of these, or you've heard about people talk about an SQM or a sky quality meter. This light pollution map over here actually has an overlay for SQM measurements. You can input your own if you want to be part of the community global database. But in any event, that's something that um, I actually also measured. So here's an example. I have one of these. This is at the Bell Museum in the background. And there at the Bell, which is in, you know, pretty close to downtown Minneapolis, there's a, a sky quality meter measurement of around 18. This line looks like it moved a little. Oh, there it is, 17, 19. And um, you can see here that the uh, 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 visibility of the Milky Way is not great, and you're nearly not you're not visible, which is not, and you can't see that many stars. So this is a little bit of context of what is sky glow, how it affects things, and now what I want to do is tell you what I did for my project that I think might be of interest to you, that you might be able to benefit from these results and perhaps. Uh, adapt them or modify them or use them yourself in a way that you might find helpful. Uh, what, so what I did was to travel across the state. This was again in 2020, 2019 and 2020. Um, most of it was done in 2020. It was a perfect thing to do during a pandemic. Let me tell you that. And, you know, I started off at the uh, end of the Gunflint Trail. That's in very northern Minnesota, right up next to Minnesota. This is Bordel Class 1 all the way down to the steps of the State House building in downtown St. Paul, which is Bordeaux Class 9. So Minnesota actually has all nine Bordeaux classes uh, within the uh, state boundary. So I just found some sites in each one of these locations, and I went out there during a clear, moonless night. And let me tell you, there are not a lot of clear, moonless nights in Minnesota when there's not snow on the ground. We didn't want to have snow because the snow artificially brightens things up. But I found enough to put them together, and... Uh, you know, if you're from Minnesota and you're interested, these are the um, locations. This is one of the boundary waters. I couldn't measure the sky quality meter because uh, I had an aurora borealis display. That's one that you saw at the beginning. But the other ones, they, they correlated pretty well. Here's a picture of me. This is, I had another camera that I used. Um, this is on a, I don't know if you can see the stars. You probably can't, but this is actually a, a moonlit night. I, you always have to wear boots in Minnesota because there's all kinds of squishy things under underfoot. Um, this is my red hat, so I don't get shot uh, by someone looking for ducks, you know. Um, and uh, there we are. So this was a typical deal. And here's what I did. So, um, you know, went out to these spots. This this picture of the camera is during the daytime. And not really important to get into the details. The key thing is I can assure you that I kept the camera settings comparable. 
The only thing I changed was the ISO to compensate for the different brightness. I kept the aperture the same, I kept the focal length the same, and I kept the duration of the exposure the same. So and I did three sets of uh, 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 image captures. Uh, the Milky Way, as you can see on the top, the Summer Triangle, as you can see here in the middle, and then the Big Dipper, as you can see here on the bottom. So what I want to do is I want to go through each one of these, and I just want to give you a side-by-side -side comparison of how the sky looks, how each one of these things looks in each of these different portal classes, because that was what I was interested in. It's like, okay, here's the Big Dipper. And what I'm going to do now is I'm going to go to, this is the brightest spot. You can actually see this. This is the flag on the top of the Capitol building, if you can believe that. And here's the Big Dipper, I've outlined it here. And this next slide, I'm gonna remove the outline. So these are the stars. And yes, they're dim, but look, you can still see them. Here's Mizar, you can see the Alcor, the, the, the double star system right there. Uh, you can see the stars in the big in the handle. You can see the, 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 uh, the, the ladle part of the Big Dipper. So, um, so in the next, so I'll go through this next slides pretty quickly so you can get a, a real comparison. But what I'm gonna show you is on each line to go portal class nine, eight, seven, you know, pretty much all the way through. And as you'll progress, you'll, you'll, you'll see more and more stars. So this is a portal class nine. It's this white dot on the map is where it was. This is portal class eight. Start to see some more stars. This is where it is on the map. Portal class seven, this kind of pinkish region, you see a lot more stars, especially in this upper right hand corner. I mean, if you look back to here, if you go back to the, the state capital building, this is gone. But then all the way here, we already start to see some stars. And then um, this is Bordeaux class six, Bordeaux class five, Bordeaux class four or three. I guess I skipped over four in this instance. Look at all these stars now. It's a, it's a cacophony of stars. And then Bordeaux class two, look at all these stars. I mean, it's a beautiful thing. This is the SQM. This is really not that far away from the Twin Cities. And, you know, this is really what this was all about is to get this together a collection of, of results that you know you can use that anyone can use so if you live no matter where you live in in the state of minnesota or elsewhere and i'll get to that you can refer to let's say these uh, comparison images or you perhaps you can get your own to get an estimate of you know if you live in let's say a border class seven region and you want to get to a border class three it's like is, is it worth the drive i mean how far do i have to go to be able to see what i want to see and this gives you a way this these are all field images um, done with a fairly carefully calibrated conditions. Let's do the same thing with the Milky Way. So here we have a 14 millimeter lens, f3.5, 20 second exposures, and we're just varying the ISOs. So this time we're gonna do it in reverse. So here's that same image. I'm pointing out Jupiter, Saturn, here's Antares and this other star in Scorpius. So this is Bordeaux class two, but now we're gonna get brighter. So this is Bordeaux class three. Start to see this, you see the dome. And by the way, we're, um, north of the Twin Cities, and we're going to heading south, so we're heading, heading towards the, the light dome in this case. We're, this is a south-facing view. This is Bordeaux class three, Bordeaux class four. Oh, there's that image we saw at the beginning, Bordeaux class five. And look at the, where we are on the map. We're now actually inside the light dome, and the entire sky is starting to lose its detail. We've lo we're really beginning to lose the structure of the Milky Way. Here's Bordeaux class six. You can sort of tell right here in the brightest and the Sagittarius star clouds what's going on, but um, for the rest of it, it's largely gone. I've you know, carefully identified the same, the two planets here and these two stars. This is Bordeaux class seven, pretty much game over. Bordeaux class eight, this is downtown Minneapolis. And then Bordeaux class nine, I mean, you can see the two stars and the planets, but absolutely, I mean, these are just um, lens flares from the... Uh, uh, from the, all the lights reflecting off the, you know, internally reflecting off the lenses. So it's, it's pretty hopeless. So, but again, you know, you can really put these together and I've lined up the images carefully for you. And you can, uh, all of this information is on exhibit at the Bell Museum online. And you can we're also going to have a, an opening when the museum opens back up. And what you can do is just say, okay, well, if I want to really capture a Bordeaux class three or Bordeaux class two, or even Bordeaux class one, you know, actually, again, the good news is there's a lot of the state, which is a blue color, which is this Bordeaux class three, even Bordeaux class four isn't awful. And that's, uh, I think it's actually surprisingly good news even today. So it's, it's just an undeniable fact that the population is concentrated in these bright areas and that's why they're so bright, frankly. So that's just something to keep in mind. Um, this is, uh, yeah, I'm just gonna skip over that part. And the last thing I wanna do is, this is that all sky view of the uh, St. Paul, or sorry, the Split Rock Lighthouse. And here's the glorious Milky Way, summer Milky Way, 
stretching overhead. And if you can see these three relatively bright stars, it's kind of hard to pick out because there's so many stars, they get easily lost. These are the three stars that make up the Summer Triangle. And um, if you've never heard of the Summer Triangle, it's well, Northern Hemisphere, it's a well worth looking up and uh, learning how to identify because it'll really help you find your way around the night sky. And so these are, as I say, these are the three stars. You can make them out here. And all of the photography I did of the Summer Triangle we did the Big Dipper Milky, and we're going to finish up here with the Summer Triangle, is to orient the camera as best I could to capture the Summer Triangle in this orientation. So um, the top of the image is right here, as you'll see. So this is the, what the actual image looks like. So these three stars are the Summer Triangle. I'll make that connection here. So we're really, the, the key thing I want to tell you is, is, is have a look at this. Uh, what we're looking at is this triangle is right in the middle of the Milky Way. All right, so the Milky Way passes right through the middle of this triangle. So when I show you this triangle, there's the Milky Way right there. Bam, right through the middle of the screen. Here's the North American Nebula. There's some little galaxies and there's some really cool stuff. But we have the Milky Way that's doing its little dance across the screen. It's kind of undulating like a snake up and down through the screen. So I'm now going to remove the lines. And again, we're starting off with Bordo Class 2. And you can see these three stars. They're kind of hard to see. But now when we get to brighter skies, here's Bordel 3, Bordel 4, what a difference, Bordel 5, um, that's Bordel 6, I skipped 5, here's Bordel 7, look at this, there's the three stars, you can actually make the stars out pretty easily, but we've lost the Milky Way completely, here's Bordel Class 8, no trace of the Milky Way, you can still basically make out the, the stars, Bordel Class 9, again, but the good news here, you can see the stars, okay, the Milky Way's gone, hopeless, and again, the reason it's gone is because the sky glow, all this gray sky, that's that light that the sky, the air is actually glowing and giving off light that is, uh, um, that is interfering with our view of the night sky. So uh, putting all this stuff together, I mean, this is, again, um, the information that's uh, available at the Bell. And I think I'm going to be sharing this elsewhere, maybe through the uh, International Dark Sky Association. And here we have the different uh, views of the Summer Triangle for the different portal classes, two all the way through nine. And I think the thing that's exciting about that is if you put all these things together, here's the state map of Minnesota. We have the Big Dipper. We have the Summer Triangle. We have the Milky Way. You can do this for any different color in Minnesota. You can do this for, you know, you can estimate, you know, what's the, uh, what's the visibility of the Milky Way? Well, how many stars can I see? If I'm in Bordel Class, if I'm in this blue zone, I go over here, okay, that's Bordel Class 3. Bordel Class 3, I should be able to see 5,000 stars. Let's find a Bordel Class 3. Oh, it looks like this. That's pretty good. Or if I live in Bordo class five, maybe I want to get to Bordo class three. And, you know, this isn't good just for Minnesota. It's good for the United States. It's good for the world. So no matter where you are, anywhere in the world, you can use these results to gauge what the night sky looks like anywhere. Um, it, it really it doesn't matter. It really shouldn't matter. And, you know, it's just to also to, to make the connection with what the images we saw earlier between the aurora, you know, Jupiter and stuff. All of these images were taken from differently different brightness zones within Minnesota. And there's opportunities even, I mean, that, that view of the moon setting over the St. Paul Capitol building um, was done in the brightest steps of the, of the state house capitals I mentioned. And, you know, there's opportunities to shoot no matter where you are. So what can we do to help? This is what International Dark Sky Week is all about. What can you do? What can I do? What can we all do together to make a difference? And this is where the International Dark Sky Association comes in. So if you're unfamiliar with this or you're just learning about it, Unbelievable uh, resource, super proud. I'm, a, as I mentioned, a delegate to the IDA. This is an incredible photograph by Betty Maya Foot of the uh, uh, IDA. And what you can see here is, if you go to their website uh, under resources, there's all kinds of resources you can use. It's public outreach materials. This is all freely available. Publications, videos. There's a Losing the Dark film. I'd highly encourage you to watch this film. It's about 15, 20 minutes. It's, it's quite, um, it's informative and also slightly horrifying, but in very informative and uh, motivating and inspirational. So check that out. Uh, but there's two things I want to um, talk about before we go to the, the Q&A session. And the first thing is, you know, what can we all do about this? Um, what can we all do about the, uh, the issue of, of, of sky glow and light pollution? And one of the first things you can do is to, and this is, this is not rocket science, you can just literally uh, shield your lights. So you're aiming 
the lights down. And this has a huge impact. You can see in this kind of schematic when it's, the lights are going up, they're creating the sky glow, which obscures the stars, blocks our view of the stars. When the lights are down, all of a sudden you can start to see the stars because there's less sky glow. Um, it's also kind of a nice thing to do because you're not shining your lights into your neighbor's house. Um, you know, that's light trespass. That's a name for that. And it's just a really simple way to, and if you just look at this, it's, it's easier on your eyes. If you look at the uh, illustration below on this, uh, on this parking complex in this, uh, in this building structure. On the, the, um, the view on the right shows a shielded light fixtures. And it's just a really, it's a really a nice way to go, a really big difference. You can also change the colors of the light. And this has turned out to be surprisingly important. When I first heard about this, probably, I want to say 15, almost 20 years ago, I was a little bit skeptical. I was like, well, really, what difference does that make? I'm completely convinced now. Uh, there's been so much research done on the uh, the effects on uh, people, on the effects on natural ecosystems, uh, you know, plant life, animal life, insect life, you know, insects or animals, but, uh, people, human health. And the, the reason is simple, is that the change in lighting from incandescent lights to LED lights that started quite a while ago, the LED lights actually include a blue component a much stronger blue component, which mimics daylight and tricks our brains into reacting as if we're surrounded by daylight, even though it's nighttime. And this is not a good thing for our, uh, for our, 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 our health. And so what you can do, what I've done at home and what you can do too, is to switch over your, your uh, lighting to a warmer uh, uh, color. And what <laughs> this is very confusing because I know th these are actual temperatures. And as a physicist, I look at these temperatures like, well, that's actually a cooler temperature, 2700 Kelvin compared to 6500. Go with it. The warmer lights have a lower Kelvin temperature. Um, so, you know, I guess that's cooler, isn't it? So, the, I mean, having said all that, I just realized I contradicted myself. So that's the nature of this pandemic in uh, 2021. So, um, no, that's right. Yeah. So the warmer lights are actually, oh, that, I just contradicted my contradiction. So we're going to, we're going to pull the emergency brake and move on. Point is choose warmer lights, orange lights, yellow lights, skip the daylight lights for indoor lighting um, in the evening. Cause it's, it, it's, it's not so great. So in any event, that's kind of my thing. So I just, I, I wanted to give you this overview. I did want to have some acknowledgements to uh, the McKnight foundation and the bell museum. I also wanted to acknowledge the Carlos Avery Wildlife Management Area and the Minnesota Landscape Arboretum, the great partners in, uh, in this project and giving me access to places that are not normally open. Of course, the International Dark Sky Association, the Light Pollution Map um, info, my family for putting up with me heading out, you know, all the time. Um, NASA for all the uh, public resources they have available. And, you know, if we're not already connected on social media, I suspect many of us already are, but if we're not, this is my Instagram. I not very active on Facebook, honestly, but uh, Instagram and Twitter. Um, and my email address, in case you'd like to just communicate directly, is uh, mike at mikeshawphotography.com. Um, if you have any questions about this uh, presentation or if you'd like to follow up in any aspect of it, please just contact me and we'll have a little chat and figure out how we can how we can help. Um, and I think that's about it. So I'm going to stop. Where am I? Where am I here? I'm going to go to um, this screen. I'm going to come up here and to stop the screen sharing. I think this is going to do it. Turn screen share off. Yes, there we are. Hello, everybody back in town. So um, got some great comments there. It's an only great to see you. Thanks. And Cameron as well. So yeah, I don't know if there's any questions. I know this is kind of an odd format because we have, uh, you know, the comments um, are, are just our primary way. You know, many of us are used to doing sort of joint Zoom sessions and we have this kind of dynamic back and forth. So this feels a little bit um, less like that. But, uh, you know, if there's any questions I can help out with, but, you know, the, the purpose of the presentation really was to, uh, again, to convey some thinking about ways we can characterize the night sky, we can visualize what it is we're seeing, um, you know, what impacts we all have on the, on, the, on the night sky, and also to just highlight the efforts that the International Dark Sky Association, uh, again, discover the night. This is my proud um, International Dark Sky Week t-shirt. You can get these. I think there's still a few available through the links at the International Dark Sky Association. They're super comfortable, I might add. They're very high quality. Uh, not getting a commission. But yeah, so I mean, um, 
uh, you know, it's just something that's so important to all of us right now. And uh, I know we have a lot of uh, demands on all of us, you know, stop driving, stop using plastic, stop using lights, stop existing. And yeah, they're all important. Uh, they really are. I mean, we, you know, use a lot of energy that impacts the environment in a terrible way. And I'm guilty of it. We're all guilty of it. And it really behooves us all, I think, uh, to our, our, our future generations to really think about that, our usage, and try our best to really minimize that. So um, I think that's really about it. So, you know, I think it's these are busy times. I don't want to just you know, sit here and ramble on if, um, you know, we're all good. So it looks like we're all good. But uh, so this is, um, so Snow is asking me, have we considered doing this on an ongoing basis? Yes, that is something. I, we don't have a, an organized effort to do that, but I think that's a critically important thing because so the question Snow is asking in the chat is, um, can we do this over time? And I think that's, that's such an important point, actually, because part of the Bell Museum's manifesto is to be, they're a field museum of natural specimens. And what I've tried to create are archival snapshots in time of different specific locations in the state of Minnesota that can serve as night sky specimens. So it's like a specimen collection, if you will, of the night sky. So then it, uh, if we did go back in two to five years and repeat this and see if there'd been a, a noticeable degradation using the sky quality meter, using the visual appearance of the images, you can perhaps see what the dimmest magnitude of the star you can discern. That would be a very useful way, a Sonali, of, um, of, of uh, following up with this. So I think that would be an important thing to do because these really are, you know, I, I've been trained as a scientist. <laughs> yes, I am a scientist. And um, I did my best to, you know, collect these uh, specimens um, uh, in a way that would be uh, reproducible. I'm getting what Milton's asking, where did you take the picture behind me? This particular image was shot at the, uh, this is um, Mount Boney in the Santa Monica Mountains National Recreation Area. It's a beautiful location right outside of Los Angeles. And um, this was uh, adopted by the uh, National Park Association and it's exhibited at the Los Angeles airport at a, like a, you know, 12 foot by X number of feet print. So if you're ever flying into LAX, remember airplane, <laughs> remember flying and that sort of thing. If you happen to see this, uh, this print, you'll, uh, you'll, now you know where it came from. So, um, well, look, you know, I, we, I, we're all busy. Um, thank you so much for joining in this evening. Uh, it's been an absolute pleasure sharing this information. If, like I say, if you have any follow-up uh, inclination whatsoever, then uh, thanks. Thank you, Milton. Um, Mike at MikeShawPhotography.com. Again, appreciate it. Uh, DarkSky.org for the International Dark Sky Association. Hop on social media and look for the hashtag IDSW2021. That's International Dark Sky Week. Sorry, yeah, IDSW. International Dark Sky Week. 2021. So hashtag IDSW2021. And that'll take you to um, uh, a whole list. I'm very welcome, Jenny. That'll take you to a whole list of, um, of other efforts. That meant there's been, there's all kinds, there's literally hundreds of people participating in this uh, International Dark Sky Week this, this week. So uh, I'd encourage you to, to pursue those. And maybe I'll see you at one of them later on. So if there's nothing else, I'll just say thanks again so much for joining everyone. I hope you have a, a great evening. And uh, and stay in touch. Thanks very much again.